Welcome to your Active Stack Brief podcast. My name is Luca Bertuzzi, your technology editor. This week, we take a closer look at the state of the AI landscape. For an overview on all technology in the EU, sign up to our free newsletter or visit the website youractive.com. This is your Active Stack Brief podcast. Today, I'm joined by Mark Surman, Executive Director of the Mozilla Foundation. Hi, Mark. Hi. Great to be here, Luca. Likewise. Great to have you. Um, so, Mark, since you have taken over the helm of the foundation in 2009, you have uh, refocused its work on artificial intelligence. Uh, by that time, did you expect AI to become such a buzzword in a few years' time? Well, first of all, 2009 feels like a long time that I've been there. And I think what had changed over that last almost 15 years is when I came, Mozilla was really just focused on the web and, you know, where is the web going and the open web. And it really became clear in 2016, 2017, that in many ways, AI, data, machine learning, those were going to be the technologies like the web that would define the next era. And so, you know, we've been thinking about this for a long time. How do you take the values in the Mozilla Manifesto, privacy, human agency, and make sure the next era of technology reflects them? So in terms of like how this current hype cycle comes, in many ways, the stuff that people are talking about now is the stuff we've been thinking about over the last five years. How is AI driving misinformation or a consolidation of power or really knowing you know, what the truth is or what's going to happen with jobs? Um, and we're actually just glad that that set of conversations is coming to the forefront. Right. And and it's interesting you mentioned data because I have the impression uh, AI is sort of the new data. Uh, the last decade, a lot of people have been talking about the potential of data and now uh, AI is the new buzzword. So what is your view on the current landscape in, in artificial intelligence and to what extent is this uh, hype uh, justified? Well, I, I do think we're at a real inflection point where... Uh, AI is becoming the technology, much like the web became the technology 20, 25 years ago, that is going to get used in everything. So nobody's going to build an app or a car or a anything that has digital inside it without AI, without uh, you know automation. AI is really like, in many ways, the programming language of now. And data is just a part of that. Data is a part of the programming language of now. So, uh, you know, I, I think that the the level of attention we're paying right now is is helpful and is right. And great things will come of it and nasty things will come of it. And we need to decide where to take it as society. I will say, though, that the nature of the hype, the nature of the public conversation is a little bit wrong, in my view. You're getting into this whole conversation of like, will the AI take over or is this going to be a godlike AI? I don't think that is the thing to be worried about right now. I think the question's about... Are there monopolies controlling this stuff? Are we considering the near-term human impacts and dangers? Are we writing the right laws? Those are actually the questions to be asking. So before uh, we enter into that, um, it, it's interesting that you mention an inflection point because uh, this period really reminds me of when the first smartphones were released. They were like the new the new toy. Uh, people were playing with them. They looked cool. They were still not perfect. You could see some big flaws there. And now they are everywhere. Uh, they're embedded in every social practice. So is that what we are looking at? Is this a new iPhone moment? I think that's a good way to talk about what this inflection point is. It's a technology that looks exciting and is, uh, and we don't know what to do with it yet. Um, I mean, that's really the difference of, say, as ChatGPT and all of these other kind of large language models come out, uh, it's not like that's brand new technology. If you've been in the AI space and watching it, that kind of scale of large scale machine learning it's been evolving over the last few years. And those of us who've been watching it kind of saw the first things that went, oh, wow, it can do that three or four years ago. What's happening now is people are getting it in their hands, like the first smartphones, and they're saying, this does something cool that surprises me. But we'll still have years, decades of figuring out what this stuff is for. 
Um, and as I've said, I, I think it'll be for some pretty cool stuff. I think we'll use it in healthcare, in making our lives easier, in sort of how we kind of get through life. I think there's lots of stuff that will surprise us and will be great, but it's also tremendously powerful. And as we saw with social media, for example, when we rush ahead in the move fast and break things mode, and that's what's happening, you can also have big human and social side effects like addiction or breaking democracy. So we need to be learning from the last 10 years and making sure that we actually ask some hard questions as this stuff evolves. Right. And and since you mentioned chat GPT, because that's where all these uh, hype started uh, back in November, um, I'm wondering how revolutionary was chat GPT and, and now GPT-4 uh, for, for someone that has been following this sector for some time? How significant were they in the grand scheme of, of things in the development of AI more generally? Well, chat GPT in particular, which is just the chat bot written on top of GPT-3 and then 4, uh, is not particularly revolutionary. It's much more the first example of packaging this technology in a way that people could understand and, and use. Um, what's revolutionary underneath is the idea of these large language models that are trained on a trillion parameters that can be used for many things. I mean, they're, they're called transformer models because they can take, you know, something and turn it into another thing. They can take text and turn it into an image. They can, uh, you know, move between languages sometimes. So I think the idea that we have functional neural net driven, you know, massive systems. That is revolutionary. But again, that's been what has been emerging over the last three, four or five years and, and comes from a lot of the innovation of the last decade of machine learning. But, but that doesn't make it less exciting or interesting or dangerous or curious because once we take an innovation and make it something that people can interface with, that's when the the exciting things and the weird things and the dangerous things start to happen. So, you know, we should be paying attention. But the chatbot itself, that that's not the big innovation. Indeed, ChatGPT has been uh, one of the, if not the fastest growing uh, internet service in the last months. So indeed, it, it seems that the scale is rather unprecedented, over 100 million users worldwide. So... Um, in your view, did the, what was the the intention behind going public? For example, we see that these uh, language models are finding patches very quickly. Is that due also thanks to the uh, all the data points that they get from these million users? Um, there is this famous example of these. Uh, hands with more than five fingers that was patched relatively quickly, perhaps quicker than the industry expected. So do you think this um, this public launch was also a way to get a head start, collect more data points and refine their model better? Yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons that these things came out when they did. Um, one thing is to be first to market. And, you know, we never heard of most people never heard of GPT before, whether it was GPT-2, 3, or 4, or, or heard of chat GPT. And frankly, most people had written Microsoft off as kind of like an old company that used to make Windows or that makes the Xbox or, or whatnot. So it also has refreshed Microsoft's brand as somebody who's very tied to, to chat GPT and who's putting it into Bing and soon into Office. So I think there was a, a market positioning piece I think there is another piece of getting it out there so that it can adapt more quickly. What's missing is re really the responsibility that goes with releasing something that's that new to billions of people. Like, yes, there's hundreds of millions of uh, people using ChatGPT, but we're rolling it out in other pro products. But we're rolling it out in other products. And that's something that means billions of people are going to be touched by this really in the next year or two. And that's at the same time as the responsible AI teams are being downsized at places like Microsoft. So I, I will say, like, it's understandable the motivation for coming out with this stuff and doing product improvement quickly. But we've already seen the impact of, you know, not thinking about the impacts of tech 
going out at that scale. And it's pretty worrisome, and I think you're you're seeing the the worry expressed by politicians or even people in the tech industry itself of not having a plan to keep this stuff evolving and do so responsibly. So uh, let's build a bit on that because, uh, again, if we make a parallel uh, with the past, if you take social media, they were when they were first released, everyone was very excited. Uh, it was even a moment when they looked like they would. Uh, rejuvenate uh, the democracy with the Obama campaign. And then came the Trump era, came Brexit, and uh, we looked at this old sort of societal risk stared us in the face. So how can we move ahead and try to address them before, you know, we have some very worrisome developments um, that then we need to address? You know, it, it's a great question, and I, I think of it on, in a couple of different ways. I, I think about taking a responsible attitude. I, I think about building alternatives, and then I think about that regulation does come in and, and play a role. So on taking a responsible attitude, we've seen enough, and we've seen the scale of the tech industry grow um, you know, in the last era, as you're talking about, that really any tech company, anybody rolling out these products should be coming with a responsible attitude. That just means like enough investment in people who are asking the responsible AI questions or the human impact questions. And I, I think we should expect more of that now from OpenAI, from Microsoft, from Google. And, and I don't see as much investment and as much thoughtfulness going there. The, the second piece, I think, is you need alternatives in the market that are driven by responsibility. And, you know, when, when you think about the Microsoft browser monopoly that, that preceded Firefox, things were going in a very narrow direction. The web was kind of getting crappier. Microsoft owned 98 percent of the market share. You needed an alternative to come out in Firefox and say this actually needs to be an open system, needs to be re-democratized, and that eventually led to Chrome and Safari and a much more open internet. I think we need to see smaller players, and Mozilla would like to be one of those players, stepping into this market with an alternative perspective, alternative set of products that are not just run by the big players. And then I, I think the third thing is regulation, which is always going to be slow, uh, does need to come in both to protect space for those alternative smaller players and also make sure there's a, accountability for being responsible. I want to touch upon the, the competition aspect in a moment, but first, are market dynamics even uh, favoring responsible attitude? Because, uh, for example, we know that Google had similar language models to ChatGPT, but decided not to release them to the public, and then they felt pressured uh, by OpenAI to do so. So, I mean, these uh, positioning of the market that you mentioned before, doesn't that play against ha having a more responsible attitude? Well, that's the that's the theory and that's the case that you're going to hear from the dominant players is there's an arms race, we need to rush, we don't have time for responsibility. I don't know what happened in that conversation in the White House where all the tech bosses got called in to talk about AI, you know, a few days ago. But my guess was market schmarket show up and be more responsible. Like, I'm sure that's what they heard. And so I think we're at a spot where you're going to see much more extreme reaction from governments and the public if at least some level of voluntary responsibility can't be increased. And my guess are going to be enough pressure to see some of that. I don't think it will be enough because the incentives are not there, whether it's the market incentives or, or just even the independence to be critical of your own work. And, and it is where, you know, we, we launched Mozilla Ventures as a way to support other companies back in the fall. We're investing in a lot of AI safety companies because you are going to need independent third parties to be looking at these responsibility and safety questions as well. The people building the core stuff for, for mainstream markets uh, also are going to need kind of outside folks to, to keep an eye on them. Right. And so uh, behind AI, there are essentially three elements, uh, data, computing power, and then the, the actual ac algorithm. So whereas in the algorithm, you can have some sort of uh, underdog innovation that breaks uh, the monopoly of, of big tech, the data and computing power are very much related to scale. 
And we are seeing that now all the large tech companies are building to develop their own version of generative AI. So how how much space is there for new realities to emerge? Well, there's a couple of things. I would add a fourth thing on top of your, your list. So, you know, you have data, compute, and the algorithms, and then you have everything that everybody uses them for. And so, you know, at, at this point, we're kind of looking at the programming language as opposed to looking at what people are going to make with the programming language. And, I mean, all of the stuff that is emerging eff- effectively is raw material technology for building apps, for building experiences. So I think we need to start looking at what's what's possible in terms of new people entering the market and using these raw material technologies in, in what ways. And I don't think we even begin to know just like we didn't begin to know what the when we just first had the web browser or when we first had the smartphone. So I think there's a, a really important thing to not get too stuck in those three things, which are, are really the foundational elements. But you still ask a good question is, is even in that foundational elements, do we just have to accept that they're owned by the same big companies that own the rest of tech? And, and I do think that's a, a thing to worry about. There's two places to watch. Well, maybe three. Um, you know, one is will um, will compute change and also the efficiency of the technology change that it becomes much more affordable. There's a lot of people working on that and you're seeing that the price of compute could could drop a lot. But also that how we how big the data sets are and how kind of how much horsepower you need actually in running a model and training a model to do something for a specific task, an already trained model. The price of all that is coming down. I mean, you're seeing it in things like GPT for all that are taking the Llama model and just running it on a, a cheap laptop to have your own personal AI. So I think one thing is costs may go down and the accessibility of this stuff as open source may really change the game. And there was a leaked memo from from Google that kind of talked about this uh, last week. And then the other piece, though, is even if that's true, and especially if that's not true, it is big players with with lots of resources that control the core technologies. Mm-hmm. And you can see that what they're tending towards is to use that to consolidate their dominance in cloud computing. And I think we will need to point our eyes at uh, antitrust and competition and cloud computing and the role that providing the core AI APIs um, plays in building monopolies or, or closing down sort of oligopoly markets in, in the cloud computing space. Uh, you hinted at a very different fact, uh, which is that innovation is not only related to technology, but also what you do with technology. So I know this roughly equates to looking at a crystal ball, but what what are in your minds the sectors and jobs that will be the most affected uh, by this race of uh, AI? It's interesting, the debate about jobs, because we immediately go to what's going to be lost, which I realize that's not what you're asking. You're saying what's going to be most affected. And I think, you know, I, I actually am a believer in the the kind of the people who point to every kind of innovation has meant we've lost jobs but created new ones. And I think some of that will happen. And we can't really see in the crystal ball. If I'm optimistic, I would hope that uh, there's more space for creativity or more space for things that are actually kind of really human. Um, And I think some of that will will happen. Um, Yes, we can have AI-generated music, and maybe that will mean that um, the music in the elevator comes from an AI, but you know, having uh, having people who can perform live music is something that isn't being replaced in the near term, and maybe it creates more of a demand for for that. I think the other place, though, that we need to pay more attention, and this is especially true for policy audiences, is how is AI as a management tool going to affect work? And we see that very much in the gig economy where there's a real asymmetry of information and power, as there always is between employers and employees or people writing contracts and contractors. But I think we have to look at what asymmetry of power is emerging through algorithmic management. Look at the intent we had between labor laws. Like in the last 100, 150 years, Western society has said we want there to be a balance of power. We want labor not to be we want labor to not be fully exploited, for people to have rest, for people to have weekends. I think we have to go back to what is the social consensus around fair work and, and kind of just humanity. 
and look at the automation of work and, and, and make sure those laws apply. Speaking of laws, um, the EU is working on the AI Act, which is perhaps the most comprehensive uh, regulatory attempt uh, in the field of artificial intelligence. And of course, ChatGPT was not in the picture when this uh, uh, legislation was first designed. And we are seeing policymakers sort of scratching their heads and, and thinking how to include these large language models into the scope of the regulation. So how how do you respond to this? Uh, what is your message to people in the parliament, but also in, in the council that are working on the file? Well, I think to the people in the parliament who, who wrote the still not read by us uh, kind of updated view on general purpose AI, that I would say thank you. Uh, we wrote a paper sort of encouraging general purpose AI to be something included explicitly uh, in the act and it wasn't there before. And so it looks like some proposals have come out that are concrete uh, and that will mean it's in legislation and not just left for, for further interpretation. So that that's positive. Um, you know, and what we can see now is that some of the things like, um, you know, there needing to be due diligence that these things are not risky in their, in their kind of core basis, that there's documentation for downstream people to use them safely, that there are some transparency elements. Those are some of the right areas to, to focus. Whether we get the focus right in the details and how they get into the act and how enforcement works, there's still a long conversation to happen there. But it just it really feels absolutely essential that general purpose AI, whether it's you know chat GPT or the AI and something like Salesforce, things that are not just for a particular high risk use, that those are included because they're going to get used in high risk ways. And we need a framework for, for kind of managing that aspect of things. And certainly we're committed to working with policymakers and working with industry to sort that piece out. It feels like a fundamental topic for moving forward in the coming decades. And now is the time to get a, a framework that adapts but has good foundations in place. Uh, and a somewhat more specific question, because this was uh, raised last week. Uh, do you think that for understanding these very complex models, can we just refer to the technical documentation that the companies provide, or do regulators, policymakers need access to their source code as well? Well, the short answer is it, it's not that simple because uh, I think source code in the thing that is a living model based on trillions of data points um, isn't enough. I do think access to the documentation is also not enough. Really, this is a part of what we're going to have to work out going forward is what levels of transparency by whom allow us to have the kind of accountability we need. My guess is it is you know something like uh, third-party access, whether that's uh, you know, governments or people working with governments as as watchdogs being able to interrogate and audit these models, you're going to need some version of that. It can't just be the documentation. You have to be able to interrogate live systems. Interrogate live systems. And, and there are also been suggestion of using AI to police AI. Do you think that we will reach a stage where, you know, regulators will need to embed uh, some some AI system into their uh, their processes to to reach a level of understanding into these uh, models yeah absolutely unquestionably I and mean, when i say have systems to interrogate live systems those will be ai driven systems i mean again ai is really just the programming language of now and the next era of computing so if we're going to build software that interrogates software that we're regulating or that we want to make sure that the, the parties that made it are accountable that will use AI and data as as programming tools. I think we will also see uh, personal AI, AI that somehow is accountable to us individually, whether through a trusted third party, hopefully Mozilla would be one of them, or that you just run on your own laptop, that plays to some degree that same interrogation uh, kind of role. And that we're gonna have so many things coming at us, we will need some tools on our side of the table that are also automated to understand all the requests and provide our information back and, and basically help us deal with the amount of automation that's coming at us. 
Uh, a final question, because you hinted at that um, before, and uh, I would like to pick it up. Uh, this concept of the tech race. I think that a lot of people in Brussels underestimate how much, especially in the Silicon Valley, there is a sense of almost an obsession, I would say, of China and how technological developments are playing out there and how uh, the U.S. don't want to lose um, their head uh, start and their technological advantage. Um, so seen from Europe, um, do you think that what is Europe's role to play in this tech race? Is Europe uh, relegated to the role of the world regulator or is there space also for an AI revolution in Europe? Oh, there's so much. We're going to have to do a whole other podcast on that uh, set of questions. Um, so as a Canadian who sits between Europe and, and America, I kind of think about these things as well as, you know, what's our role and then where do I see Europe? Where do I see uh, the U.S.? And, and ultimately, if we go back to China as a starting point, there is a very different idea about the role of technology and society in, in China. And certainly there's a lot of the same economic imperatives, but there is a, a sense of imperatives around control and a different set of ideas about rights. You need those democratic industrial economies, the G7, uh, other, other allied countries to kind of put human rights first, put competition first, put innovation that actually kind of drives us with a, a set of values that we have all at the forefront. And that means seeing it as a U.S. versus Europe question isn't going to do well. I think we actually need to look at how we do AI research academically across the ocean and, and really across all of these industrial democracies in a more collective way and push ourselves uh, collectively in, in a good direction that reflects our values. I would say Europe does have a particular role, and you're seeing it being responded to well, I, I think, in Washington – in that coalition in saying, here's how we move with regulation. I don't see that in, in competition with the idea that Europe also can be a real industrial powerhouse in AI. That's also happening. Mark Sarman is executive director of the Mozilla Foundation. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much, Luca. That's all we got time for this week. Don't forget to sign up to our free Tech Brief newsletter to stay on top of tech news and digital policy developments in the U.S. and beyond. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast published on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music. I'm your Luca Bertuzzi, and thank you for listening. <laughs>